Hello, welcome to this new social animal podcast episode. Uh, you know, I always say that talking to people makes me feel good, and it seems that this is actually backed by research. Today, I'm talking with uh, Dr. Julian Holt Lundstadt, who studied the health benefit of having a rich social life and showed that isolation and loneliness is actually as bad as smoking or having a very poor diet. We talked for over an hour about a wide variety of topics, starting obviously with how important your social life is to your health and your well-being. You need to make your relationships a priority in your life. And um, given the evidence that we have on the health effects, you know, we need to prioritize our, our relationships, you know, just like we would exercise and nutrition. Mm. <laughs> Um, and you know, that you've got to make time in, in your life, um, for your relationships and that lacking social connection. So being socially isolated, lonely, living alone, um, is significantly associated with increased risk for, um, premature mortality. We talked about the importance of what she calls social integration, meaning that people don't only need close relationships and best friends, but we need the wide spectrum of all sorts of diverse relationships from your best friends to the people you're going to wave high on the street. Um, certainly our close relationships are very important, um, but actually having a variety of types of relationships um, has been shown to be have even a stronger effect on our health than even the size of our social network. Um, so, you know, hypothetically imagine, you know, two people have 10 people in their lives, right? Okay. Well, the person whose 10 people are entirely all friends um, may not have the same health benefit as someone who has 10 people, but their family members, friends, mm -hmm. neighbors, coworkers. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, that's, that's a hypothetical situation, but, but what research has shown is that actually having um, a diversity of, of types of relationships can um, be associated with better kinds of health outcomes, including um, immune functioning. Mm. And um, what, what we suspect is that different kinds of relationships fulfill different kinds of needs and different mm. kinds of goals. Well, we talked about how we all have a negativity bias, which can hurt our ability to connect with people like, you know, when someone is not answering your text and you're freaking out and you think they're an asshole, but really they were just busy and thinking about work. People who are chronically lonely will often have what's referred to as a, a negative cognitive bias, where in ambiguous situations, they will, um, will assume uh, some kind of um, negative context. So yeah. just for example, let's say you, you, you text a friend and um, they don't get right back to you. You know, it's like, why are you ghosting me? Yeah. <laughs> Instead it could be, well, they're driving or they're in a meeting or, you know, whatever. Um, but by automatically coming to a negative conclusion, you, you know, um, attributing that ambiguous uh, situation to some kind of negative quality, you respond negatively and they're more likely to respond. Yeah, because you, you feed the cycle. Anyway, I'll let you guys enjoy the full conversation. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like, subscribe to the channel and let me know your thoughts in the comments. I'm going to leave my email in the description if you want to reach out. That's it. Enjoy. Well, thank you so much uh, for, uh, you know, talking to me, I guess. Um, so, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm very interested in social interactions and I, uh, you know, stumbled upon your work through, uh, I think, uh, I don't even remember, but the, the, the thing that marked me was that uh, th there is someone who did a TED talk and they introduced your work and that's how I sort of like went on the, the rabbit hole. I think her name was uh, Susan Pinker. Yeah. Um, but uh, as a start, if you could just sort of, uh, you know, just introduce yourself uh, and yeah. Just introduce yourself, let's start with a broad stroke. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my name is Julianne holt -Lundstadt. Um, I'm a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Brigham Young University. And um, I've been doing research on um, the association between social connections and um, how that impacts our health. And it's focused primarily on physical health. Um, 
I don't know if you want me to go into to more detail. <laughs> so, 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 so I, I would like to know, I guess, uh, I mean, I'll start with like broad questions. And then I, I think as uh, the conversation unfold, we might go into like details. But I, so, I mean, I've, I've watched, uh, you know, I've read actually, I, I, I've read some of your papers. I, I've watched you talk uh, online, uh, but I'm just curious, like, what are some of the key insights that you got from uh, all of those uh, years yeah. studying that? Well, I mean, I think the, the, the biggest one is just how important our relationships are to our physical health. So um, my, my research has, has shown that um, being more socially connected is protective. In fact, um, it's associated with um, a 50% increase odds of survival. Um, and then, uh, um, and, but conversely, <clears throat> sorry, conversely, okay, no um, that lacking social connections. So being socially isolated, lonely, living alone, um, is significantly associated with increased risk for, mm. um, premature mortality. Mm. And, um, and, and, you know, in, in benchmarking that, what we found was that in essence, the effect that these have on, on our risk for premature mortality are comparable with lots of other factors um, from lifestyle factors to um, kind of medical kinds of interventions um, that, that we take very seriously for our health, that we you know, put a lot of time and resources into. And um, it, you know, it became clear that, that uh, generally um, as, as a public, we underappreciate um, just how important our relationships are for our health. Mm. Uh, also something I find uh, very interesting about your research is that so, you know, they were, I feel like there's a lot of uh, research on, uh, you know, how close relationships are so vital to, uh, I mean, I remember the Harvard study on, on happiness, uh, but um, I think what's interesting in your research is that you, you talk about social integration, uh, where it's like just sort of, uh, you know, I, 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 you could say like weak, weak interactions or just sort of like random interactions through the day. And, and I feel like I feel like a lot of people, when they listen to, oh, you know, relationships are important, they, they mostly think about like close relationship, but you seem to, to say that actually, no, I mean, close relationship are important, but it's, it's also like, how does one fit in the community and, and how do they interact with people on a daily basis? Um, how, like, yeah, yeah do, do you have something to, to, to say about that? Like, how did you? Yeah, know? yeah. So um, certainly our close relationships are very important. Um, but actually having a variety of types of relationships um, has been shown to be, have even a stronger effect on our health than even the size of our social network. Um, so, you know, hypothetically imagine, you know, two people have 10 people in their lives, right? Okay. Well, the person who's 10 people are entirely all friends um, may not have the same health benefit as someone who has 10 people, but their family members, friends, mm. neighbors, coworkers. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, that's, that's a hypothetical situation, but, but what research has shown is that actually having um, a diversity of, of types of relationships can um, be associated with better kinds of health outcomes, including um, immune functioning. Mm. And, um, what, what we suspect is that different kinds of relationships fulfill different kinds of needs and different mm -hmm. kinds of goals. And so, you know, I'm sure most people can relate to this. Um, you know, we um, often go to family members or, you know, certain friends or, or others for, for different kinds of things mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and maybe to fulfill different kinds of, of needs. And, um, and so having um, a, a, you know, a, a diversity of these kinds of relationships, including the ones that may be you know, considered more of, of these um, weak ties um, can be important because um, for instance, weak ties um, often 
you know, it's the people that you wave to, you know, maybe as, as you're, you know, walking in, in your community or the, um, the person um, at the grocery store who you chit chat with <laughs> um, while they, um, you know, ring up your groceries. Um, but, uh, but this helps us feel connected to our community. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a, a connection we feel um, to individuals as well as the connections to a larger community and, and that sense of belonging yeah. um, can, can um, be important as well. I mean, I, I definitely relate to this because I felt that uh, the, day where, the days where I, I just randomly interact more with people, you know, I joke with someone at the coffee shop or whatever, like I, I just feel, uh, first of all, I would say I feel happier. And, and I feel like if, if I talk to enough people in a day, kind of like randomly, not for work or anything, but just kind of like through my day, I feel, uh, yeah, you feel like a connection with humanity in a way. Like you feel, uh, you, you feel very happy, you feel connected, you, you're like, you're almost like overflowing with like things to say and little like comments. And uh, I can definitely uh, relate to that. Um, I was curious, did you enter this field of research through the gate of, you know, how, like, uh, what can make people live longer? Like, was that the start or was the start, uh, oh, I'm very interested in social interaction. Like what, like, w w you know, like how, how did yeah. you start? Like, what was your starting point? Well, it's, it's kind of a, a little bit different than, than that. Um, okay. I, you know, when I was in, in graduate school, I was doing a lot of laboratory based studies where we were, um, we were doing psychophysiology um, and they were stress protocols. <laughs> okay. um, and so we were looking at how, um, how people's physiology responds in stressful situations um, with the aim of getting insight into how our, our body responds on a daily basis uh, that has, that would explain how, um, how, how these long-term health outcomes occur. Mm. And as part of these studies, um, always part of it was some aspect of, of, um, either social support or social ambivalence. Um, but basically, um, the idea that, uh, others, um, you know, like what we found is that people who had more supportive um, relationships were less reactive to stress. Mm. Um, and, but that also um, people who had more um, conflict in their relationships um, were much more reactive to stress. Mm, I see. Um, and so it really got me thinking about just, I mean, two things. One is that, um, that, that, uh, our, our relationships um, are, are likely important beyond just the context of stress yeah. <laughs> in terms of our health, right? Um, but the other was that, um, that here we were spending this time looking at the biological pathways that might explain some of these associations between relationships and, and health. And yet the rest of the general public didn't, um, adequately recognize mm. that that that, um, that that relationships exist. And so that's, I think, what really led me to um, doing my meta-analyses, which I'm, I'm probably um, most well known for, um, where I, I synthesized all of the available evidence worldwide. So mm. any study, um, including that Harvard study that you mentioned, but that was just one of, so my first meta-analysis included 148 studies. So okay. that Harvard study was just one of those 148, right? <laughs> um, and we gathered all of that evidence and, and combined the data to analyze like, okay, so what do we know overall? Like mm. not just one study, but what do we know overall? <laughs> um, mm. And so that we could get a, you know, a, a really good picture of like just how impactful is mm. this? Um, and just how seriously should we take this for our health? Do you have a number like uh, like people who are like more social or like better socially integrated have a life expectancy of like X many years over the other ones or? You know, we tried to calculate that because <laughs> everyone wants to know it. 
And it turned into kind of a logistical nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. And that's because we included worldwide data. Um, each country has different life expectancies. And so oh, if we studied from Finland and it showed that they, you know, had a, um, you know, a 35% increase um, odds of survival. Um, well, that's, you know, you have to factor that into what the life expectancy yeah, is yeah, yeah. for Finland versus the life expectancy yeah. in California. Um, but, um, and then also, um, you know, it would have been tedious and we could have found that out. Um, but the problem was, is also to do those calculations, you need the standard deviation mm. <laughs> um, for each of those countries. Not that California is a country, sorry, my example was a bad yeah, one. Yeah, but <laughs> um, uh, but um, so the US <laughs> versus, you know, say um, the UK or yeah. wherever. Um, uh, and uh, anyway, um, the, you know, not having, um, uh, standard deviations we couldn't do yeah. that and, and, and uh, the, those are those standard deviations aren't regularly um made public made, i see is, is, is the issue okay and, and so okay so, so so you so you do so okay you, you're, so your research is focused on the you know like basically how the sociability of people affects their their health problem and, and do you also like uh research like what is preventing people from uh being more social or what is making some people less socially integrated than others like do you is this also part of your research or do you or do you focus more on just the the fact that there, there is a relationship like right um so you know we do try to identify in some of our studies um risk factors for people who are more socially isolated or lonely um and we have identified um some of those so for instance um uh health concerns, whether it be physical health or mental health, um, is both, both of those are risk factors for um, isolation and loneliness. Um, uh, living alone is a risk factor for mm. isolation and loneliness. Um, uh, low education and income are also mm. um, risk factors for isolation and loneliness. Um, and some studies show, you know, some other things depending on, um, on what all is assessed. Um, but uh, the one that seems to be consistent across, um, across studies is um, health issues. Health um, issues. And interestingly, that's, you know, there's this bi-directional effect. Um, so poor health, um, both physical and mental, can increase your risk of being isolated or lonely because mm. you may not be feeling well. Um, and so you might self-isolate, you might withdraw from others, um, which can lead to longer term isolation mm. and loneliness. But on, on the other hand, being isolated and lonely can increase your risk for poor mental health and mm. poor um, physical health. Mm. And, and so, um, and, and because of the effects that it can have on your physiology, which can either um, lead to the development of these poor outcomes or um, exacerbate existing underlying conditions. Mm. Um, and so there's this interesting bi bi-directional effect, but it is important to note that feeling isolated and lonely is not the same thing as depression. Um, yeah. and, and so, um, you know, people often ask the question, you know, are we really just talking about depression here? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, and studies consistently show um, that those are independent. Mm. And, and so I'm curious because, uh, so what, what do you think of, uh, I mean, I guess, you know, there's a lot of articles uh, saying that, you know, there's like a loneliness epidemic and that, you know, young people have no friends uh, like, what do you think about that? Do you think it's real? Do you think it's just people making articles? Like, what, what, how do you? You know, so I, you know, I've, I've first off, I, I wanted to know, um, you know, because of the term epidemic, <laughs> I, I wanted to know, like, are we using it correctly? <laughs> and like, I mean, like, so, do you think, and, like, and so, you know, certainly when I. I initially was, um, you know, when I tried to see like, okay, what qualifies something as an epidemic? Um, unfortunately, most definitions 
um, refer to communicable diseases. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so, but yet we, we use the term epidemic for lots of other things like an ob obesity epidemic or an opioid epidemic. <laughs> um, and so um, really what it's, it's getting at is, um, you know, is this something that is increasing in the population? And is this something that has a degree of, of um, urgency in terms of public health? And, um, and so, you know, I guess the bigger question is, is this, is isolation and loneliness actually increasing? And it's, it's somewhat difficult to answer that question because um, this has been an issue that has been not necessarily given the most attention to in the past mm -hmm. and hasn't been systematically um, assessed at a population level. Uh, and so um, while we do have assessments over time, not all national surveys use the same measurement tool. Mm. And so if you're comparing, you know, okay, it was 15% um, at this um, time, point in time, and now it's 30%, um, are those two percentages based on the same measurement tool? Mm. <laughs> um, and this is um, somewhat important because, for instance, um, in, in the US in 2018, um, there were uh, three large um, surveys done in the, in the US. Um, and uh, they all show different percentages <laughs> because they had measured it differently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so, um, it was interesting because one um, reported 22%, another one um, 33%, and another one 47%. Mm -hmm. um, and what was interesting is that um, they all used the UCLA loneliness scale, but they used different, ver they either used different versions or used a different um, criterion to classify people, like a cutoff score mm -hmm. of what would classify someone as lonely or not lonely. Um, and so the hard part is, is because of that inconsistency, it's difficult to know. Now we do have some, like for instance, one of those studies in 2018 followed up um, and in 2020, and it was before the pandemic, just <laughs> FYI. Okay. Um, and that survey did show an increase um, mm. from 2018 to 2020. And so there is some evidence to suggest that it's increasing, um, but, other data, for instance, out of the UK suggests that um, things have been relatively stable, but regardless of whether it's increasing or stable, what we do have evidence of consistently is that a significant portion of the population is, is isolated, lonely, or both. So even by con conservative standards that, you know, that one in the US that I was talking about as of 2018, that was 22%, the mm. lowest one was, you know, even if we go with that most conservative, if 22% of the population is isolated, lonely, or both, that's, that's greater than the percentage of uh, adults in the U.S. that mm. smoke. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so that's an important public health issue. So we do need to take it very seriously. <laughs> and so what, what, how do you, uh, for you, what does that mean to be lonely? Like what, what, what yeah, how do you define being lonely? Yeah, so um, that, that's, that's a great question because, um, and the, one of the ways I define it is by distinguishing it from social isolation, mm -hmm. because we use these terms interchangeably, but they yeah. actually mean different things. Um, so social isolation is objectively being alone or having few or infrequent social contact. But lonely or loneliness <laughs> um, is more subjective. It's a, a distressing, you know, feeling alone or the discrepancy between one's actual and desired level of social connections. So you can be isolated, but not feel lonely. You yeah. might actually take pleasure in being alone, <laughs> um, yeah. that solitude. And conversely, you can be um, isolated or sorry, lonely, but not isolated. So you can be surrounded by other people. Um, and yet feel profoundly lonely. And I'm sure we've all, you know, had moments where we've, you know, been at a party or been around um, a big group and just 
felt very yeah. lonely <laughs> yeah. um, where you're just not, you don't feel connected or you don't belong or whatever that might be. Um, and so the, the key distinction there is that loneliness is a subjective feeling and it's a distressing feeling. Yeah. Well, well I mean, I, I guess there's layers because I mean, when you're alone, you're alone. So that, that, that's it, it's just you. And then you meet people, but you might not meet, you know, your people, you know, you might not meet people with whom you really connect. So you, even though you're surrounded by people, you feel, you feel lonely because you don't really connect with them. And then hopefully you meet enough people that you meet those people with whom you click greatly and then you feel like you know like okay like those are my you know like you feel like uh, you know those are like your best friends like they, it feels like you're with your family almost um and yeah i mean because yeah i mean sometimes you want to be alone but sometimes you want to be with people sometimes you are with people but you'd rather be alone or you rather be with other people uh so uh yeah i mean i, I guess yeah th 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 there is d different um sort of layers but what yeah, and, well one thing i should note is that when we looked at whether there was a difference between the two in between terms what? of predicting be, between social isolation and loneliness mm. because a lot of the times people think it's really about how you feel right yeah. um and we looked at how that affects risk for premature mortality and um both significantly predicted risk for premature mortality and equivalently so. So um, being lonely increased your risk for earlier death by 26%. Mm. Being socially isolated increased your risk for earlier death by 29%. Yeah. Um, they both significantly. And so um, both are important and we don't necessarily need to elevate one as being much more important than the other because they both um, significantly predict risk. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like, for example, a lot of people, like once they graduate college, they, um, they kind of struggle to, uh, to meet new people. I mean, I would say that, you know, we're kind of like used to meet people through like very strong contexts, you know, so like usually like we meet people through school, or, like, you know, friends of friends, then, you know, we work. And I, I find it that a lot of people, once they graduate college, like they, they just don't know how to meet people because they, they, they're no longer, you know, it's like they, they leave college, then they go to work. And then, you know, you, you, you it's kind of, um, you know, those are very small, like sample sizes, right? So people then like they join like all sorts of like, you know, some people will join like activities or like meet up or whatever. Uh, and so I feel like, I feel like people, I think it's very easy to, I mean, I think that people have actionable steps to sort of like break out of social isolation. Like everyone can join, you know, like, you know, I don't know, like uh, the, the, the handball, like, club or anyone you know like there's all sorts of activities in cities like there's like those like uh, social clubs where people play sports or whatever um but i i feel a lot of people like they struggle to make those like real connection uh and i don't know if it's i feel that maybe because people don't meet enough people so you know there's a distribution like out of everyone you meet let's say you know if only like two percent are going to become like lifelong friends you know you, you need to be meeting a lot of people for you to increase those odds. Um, and um, yeah, no, no, I, I, I just feel that, yeah, that there's a lot of like young professionals who, who just don't have, you know, I don't know, like the, the, their social environment like shifts in their twenties and then they're not sure how to like, how to like navigate it. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because I think there's this mis perception that social isolation and loneliness is, is an issue um, that's like for older adults. <laughs> um, mm. and, um, and, and certainly it is important among older adults, but um, the highest prevalence is in young adults. Yeah. Um, and studies have shown consistently um, in, in the US, UK, Europe, um, I believe also in Japan, um, uh, but are consistently showing that, you know, uh, well, first of all, I should say there's no age group that's immune <laughs> um, and loneliness can affect anyone at any age, but that the highest prevalence is, is among, um, uh, among young adults. And in fact, um, uh, there was a study that came out in 2020 that showed um, that loneliness peaks at age 19. Um, 19. 
But um, also the BBC survey, uh, what they found was even when they asked older adults who were lonely to describe a time when in their life when they were the most lonely, they described when they were young adults. <laughs> Um, and so, um, 19, 19 is a, is a, is an interesting year because it's like the first, it's like when you go to college, basically you, I would assume. Right, right. But a lot of, and depending on the, on the study. So some show, um, you know, kind of 18 to 24, 18 to 28, but it's that, um, perhaps that, you know, life transition of, of leaving home, becoming more independent. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's that. Uh, phase of, of emerging adulthood. Um, and, uh, and, and so this is a time that can um, also disrupt your, your, your social life um, because maybe you're meeting all new friends or you, you, you know, left um, uh, where you grew up uh, and, and need to kind of establish a new network. Um, but there's also, you know, it's interesting because remember that definition of, of loneliness is that discrepancy between one's actual and desired level of social connections. And that period of, of time also, there is this normative expectation that your social network should be expanding, right? Mm. And so you see in movies and in television that that's the time when you're so social, um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, college or work or whatever, but uh, there's, there's this large, um, you know, social life at this period of time. Um, and if that isn't the case for, for you, which isn't the case for many, um, uh, it, it leads to this, this discrepancy in that expectation, mm. um, which can also potentially um, lead to, to greater loneliness mm. as well. Yeah. And, and then of course, social media might also um, add to that of um, that, that discrepancy in terms of expectations. If, if you're seeing others that seem to have much more of a, a social mm. life um, mm. relative to your own. Yeah. But yeah, but I also feel like there's also a feeling of, um, you know, I, I felt that, you know, I, I felt that as, as human beings, you know, wherever, like, whether you're like, uh, you know, introverted or extroverted, like, I, I feel like we all have moments when, you know, there's people around us and we want to talk to them. Uh, and, you know, I would say that in college that happens a lot because there's so many people around you. Uh, but I feel like, unfortunately, like in most of those moments, we, we doubt ourselves and we sort of like, we, we, we hold back, you know? And so then, you know, I, I feel like it's almost like a, like a self-respect issue where like, you know, if we, if we always censor ourselves and we always like hold back, then, you know, we, we're kind of, it's, it's a vicious cycle. Where we're like, oh, you know, but what if, because, okay, you have the expectation of the movies, but you also know, like, you know, deep down when you go to bed at night, like, oh, you know, I, I wish I had like talked to that person, you know, oh, I wish I had talked to that person. And, 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 and like all of those missed opportunities, like they just kind of like keep adding up, you know, and then I feel like some people, they may feel like, you know, th then they may, uh, there's like a gap that creates between them and like others, you know, as, as a concept. And, and, and then, you know, they kind of like uh, sort of um, turn inward, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, well, and I think there's also the tendency to um, also kind of wait for others to make the first move. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, whether it's, you know, our own, um, you know, insecurities or, or, you know, I mean, certainly it, it, it can feel vulnerable making that first move. <laughs> and, you know, what's, what's interesting is, you know, well, first of all, of course, if, if everyone waited for someone else to make, make the first move, no one would ever interact. <laughs> um, so someone's got to do it. Um, but uh, one of the things that I found really interesting in the, in some of our research is that, um, that, um, providing support for others, doing mm. um, small yeah. um, kind things for others um, was one of the best ways to, to reduce your own loneliness. And 
you know, what I thought was so powerful about that is that, you know, by looking for someone else to help, right? Or, and maybe in a social situation, that means, you know, looking for someone who might need someone to talk to or who might, um, who, who might be, you know, there alone or whatever. Um, by kind of shifting that frame of instead of, oh, should I talk to that person or not? And thinking about your own insecurities of thinking of how can I help that other person? Yeah. It, it no longer feels vulnerable. <laughs> um, and what we find in the, in the research is that um, by, by helping others is one of the best ways to help mm. yourself. I, 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 uh, what you're saying make me th makes me think of two things. The first one is, I mean, I definitely agree with the, the first point that, yeah, like, the, the, like some days when I feel like a bit uh, depressed or I just feel down, uh, I feel like, yeah, if you just go around and just like, even like get like a homeless, like a meal, or like, like, like just, just do something that uh, is going to trigger some, like, you know, the person's going to be like, oh, thank you. And stuff like you, you feel you feel useful. You see someone like smile. Like it, it feels, uh, it, it feels good. Uh, but the second thing you said is, uh, I feel like for a long time when I was younger, when I would engage with people, especially if I was I was gonna make the first move, uh, I would sort of uh, be in a expect expectative state where I was expecting, you know, is this person gonna accept me? You know, as if like I was here and I was waiting for something to a place where I kind of shifted and I was like, no, no, like I'm going to accept people. Like, instead of like thinking like, oh, am I going to, you know, am I going to get in? I, I, I take the, the opposite uh, sort of like stance where it's like, no, no, no. Like it's like you, you come under my wing. Like I'm, 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 I'm here, you know, like I'm talking to you, but like, it's not like, oh, like, please do me a favor. Like talk to me. It's like, oh, I'm talking to you. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a different, um, it's a different uh, sort of uh, like yeah, it's, it's a different dynamic. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because uh, so one of the things I wanted to mention, you know, when you were talking about, uh, you know, you finding, um, you know, giving a meal to a homeless um, individual or or you know doing something in your your community um, uh, over the um, the the past summer. Um, I did an international study, um, so the US, UK, and Australia, and we had almost, oof, I think around 4,300 people, um, and um, uh, they were randomized to do small acts of kindness for people in their community, okay. and um, and what we found, and, and then so people were either randomized to do that or, or just go about their everyday lives as they normally would anyway. And the people who were randomly um, assigned to do these small acts of kindness um, and, and who did them, <laughs> um, uh, just just small things. Um, uh, and it was only over a, a, you know four weeks um, were significantly less lonely at the mm. end of the four weeks um, mm. compared to those who who just kind of went about their everyday lives. And um, and so like, it's, it's so powerful because we have, you know, I think we all know intuitively or like, oh, if you, if you do, you know, something kind for someone else, it makes you feel good. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when it comes to these measures of loneliness, um, it's, it's pretty difficult to move the needle on. <laughs> you know, we know all of the detrimental effects of, of loneliness, but to actually reduce it um, has been quite difficult. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so to find something that's so simple that literally anyone can do and it's free <laughs> um, is, is quite remarkable. Um, and, um, you know, of course we only measured the effects that it has on the person who was helping someone else yeah. um, and doing something kind for someone else. Um, and presumably the person who was on the receiving end um, may have benefited as well. And, and, and so, you know, this is something that I think we can all do that can um, uh, certainly uh, help um, reduce loneliness yeah. on, on a larger scale. Mm. But, but I mean, I mean I, yeah, but I would say I, I see this almost as a, not a hack or a fix, but it's like, 
I mean, yeah, like it's nice, but like that's not how you're gonna meet like you know your lifelong. I mean, I mean, unless you do that all the time. I mean, like I, I feel like that's a nice thing to do, but I also feel like it's a bit. It's not like I feel like you know if someone is like, oh, you know, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I need to meet more people. I want better friends. You know, it's not just about walking around and I mean I guess they could do that but I feel like at some point it would become um, it might lose like a, the genuine I, I don't know like you know yeah and and to be clear our study was look um, you know with one's neighbors um, and so presumably you you have you know some kind of relationship with I with see. your neighbors um, and um, but I you know I think you have a point in terms of um, and and it ties back to what we were talking about earlier about how there are different kinds of relationships and how they can yeah. um, fulfill different kinds of needs and goals. And, and so um, if you're looking for a really intimate relationship, um, you know, whether that's an intimate friendship or an intimate um, romantic relationship, um, you know, that that's, um, you know, going to need to, to take things a, um, a step further, right? And, uh, and, and so that might be a little bit different, but um, certainly those other relationships we shouldn't dismiss entirely um, because they do fulfill certain needs, but, but um, certainly wouldn't necessarily fulfill the needs for intimacy. Mm. I, I, I feel that's something that blocks people a lot in, in that, uh, in that, in that, in that, you know, like you, because you just say, oh, you know, we need different types of relationship. I, I, I feel that people are, sometimes they get, um, stopped by their own like judgments um you know like they you know they see someone so this happens uh i think very frequently and i see it a lot so i, I don't know if you watch my channel but i i do a type of videos where i meet with a subscriber and i film them talking to strangers uh for a day uh and uh, a lot of times uh, you know well you know i would say like um you know, a lot of times people, they see someone they want to talk to. And, and I think also it happens a lot, you know, with, you know, guys and, you know, they see a cute girl and, and then they, they think, you know, they, so, you know, they have the first impulse, which is like, oh, you know, I noticed this person, I want to talk to them. And then the second impulse is they start like a sort of like analysis of the outcome, you know, oh, you know, is this going to be worth my time? Is this going to be interesting? Like, you know, what, why am I doing this? And, and, and they sort of like, uh, and a lot of them, what they do is they, they basically they, they project some assumption and they say, oh, this is not worth my time. I'm, I'm not going to do it. Um, and my response to this is, you know, if you want to talk to someone, you know, going and talking to someone like that's the only outcome that's important. Then, you know, who knows, maybe this person is going to end up a friend. Maybe there's going to be your wife, but maybe it's just going to be a nice 10 minute conversation that's going to carry you through the day. Uh, maybe, you know. Who knows, maybe you're looking for a roommate and they know someone, like, who knows, right? But, um, but I feel like sometimes people are, they, you know, they're about to, you know, there is someone they want to, they want to connect with, but because they don't have like the final de destination clear in their mind, they're unable to just almost like take a leap of faith and, and see where it goes, right? Because if you, if you need, you know, different relationships, in your life to take different things from all of these different relationships you need to actually well you need to start those relationships like they're not gonna you're not gonna get a package of you know five week friends uh three you know wednesday afternoon friends you know what i mean like you need to actually engage with a lot of people and the more you engage the more you're gonna have a distribution of all of those relationships that you need um and actually this is going to lead to my next question which is out of all of those people that were considered socially integrated, like the, the, the healthiest people, like, did you notice or like, did you see any patterns in the way that they, you know, engage with their community or the, like, did, did you sort of like, um, yeah. Well, so the way that the, that, that they are often measured um, is that they, and what I refer to is, or what I'm referring to is, how social integration is measured um, mm. is using these um, these assessment tools that have existed since the 70s. <laughs> okay. And so um, you know I didn't I didn't create them, but they've been used um, in these studies that follow people over decades um, and to see you know whether these factors predict um, health outcomes. And so uh, what they often measure is, um, 
how many family members you regularly have contact with, mm. how many friends you regularly have contact with, yeah. how many, um, and whether you um, belong to social groups and how um, frequently you are engaged in them. Some of them include things like your marital status or um, um, whether you belong to some kind of um, um, religion or faith-based organization. Mm. Um, and, uh, so there are these um, kind of broad uh, um, questions, but get at how, you know, if you think about when, in, when it's asking about your frequency of contact with family members, well, um, it, it's getting both at, you know, do those relationships exist and, and how, how frequently do you engage with them? Similarly to friends or to social groups. Um, and so, um, you know, people who are more likely to not only have these, these different contacts um, or, or relationships, um, but also regularly engage with them. Mm -hmm. uh, those are, are the individuals that um, tended to live, live longer. I see. And um, if someone like, I mean, if, I mean, I, I, it's not if, so, so, you know, uh, what do you, uh, what sort of advice do you have for people who, who, you know, so I, I guess, uh, yeah, I, I was gonna, yeah, sorry, no. Yeah, what, what advice do you have for people who, uh, who, you know, who, who, who wants, to, who, who want to, you know, increase their, their lifespan, I guess, or like, you know, who want to be yeah. more social, like, like, yeah. what, what do you tell them? Well, I mean, at a very broad level, I'd say um, you need to make your relationships a priority in your life. Mm -hmm. And um, given the evidence that we have on the health effects, you know, we need to prioritize our, our relationships, you know, just like we would exercise and nutrition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, you know, that you've got to make time in, in your life um, for your relationships. And, um, but, but then the next step is, well, then how do you nurture those yeah. relationships? <laughs> um, and, and, and so, um, part of that is, uh, regular contact. So, um, you know, one of the things that we know from evidence is that, um, the extent to which you feel like you can count on the people in your life. Mm. Um, influences your physiology. It influences, um, which in turn influences is your health. And so having regular contact um, builds a sense of, of, of trust that, that, you know, you can count on, on this person, but also, also being there for for others, right? Mm. Because we have strong norms of reciprocity. <laughs> and so, um, you know, in essence, if you wanna ha like have strong friendships, you, you need to start by being a good friend, <laughs> right? If you want good friends, you need to be a good friend. Um, mm. If you want others to have your back, you need to have their back. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a two-way street, um, it, it, and very reciprocal and, um, and relationships, um, you know, research has also shown that, um, in terms of building intimacy, that as you disclose personal information and others reciprocate by disclosing that this, um, cycle of reciprocal self-disclosure um, starts to get deeper and deeper and that um, can lead to deeper intimacy. Mm. Um, but other things like expressing gratitude, mm. um, you know, it, I, I know it probably sounds really, you know, maybe like pop psychology, um, but uh, there's research to suggest that by expressing what you appreciate about someone, again, can not only make them feel better, but um, it, it can build um, uh, these social bonds um, mm -hmm. because, of course, you know when we know from from research again that when you interact with someone, the more you are responsive to them, the more that they are responsive in return to you. Mm. And and so if you can be responsive 
to their needs, they're more likely to be responsive to your needs. And as you express gratitude um, to that individual, um, it leads to positive responses in return. You're not going to get negative, you, you know, you're mm-hmm. unlikely to get a negative response, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so what, but what's interesting is what we find in, you know, on the exact flip side of this is that people who are chronically lonely will often have what's referred to as a, a negative cognitive bias where in ambiguous situations, they will um, will assume uh, some kind of um, negative context. So yeah. just for example, let's say you, you, you text a friend and um, they don't get right back to you. You know, it's like, why are you ghosting me? (laughs) Instead, it could be, well, they're driving or they're in a meeting or, you know, whatever. Um, But by automatically coming to a negative conclusion, you you know, um, attributing that ambiguous uh, situation to some kind of negative quality, you respond negatively and they're more likely to respond. Yeah, because you feed the cycle. And it, and, I, I, it, it, and it reinforces then that, you know, they, right. they don't want to be my friend and, and that can reinforce the loneliness. Whereas on the flip side, the more positive you are, um, the more positivity you're going to get in return. Uh, yeah. I, I think that this is one of the hardest, like uh, mental um, sort of like perspective to adopt mm-hmm. is to sort of uh, expect the best. Like uh, I feel uh, even like when you, you know, when you just approach someone, I, I think it's very easy to, yeah, to, to fall, like, you know, to, to be trapped in your own assumption, you know? So first you, so sometimes you make negative assumptions, but sometimes also you can be sort of neutral and you approach someone, in a we you know, like very politely or, you know, like with some like distance or reserve. Um, and I think what's really hard is to kind of like talk to people as if, you know, sort of like expecting the best, you know, as, as if you were already close and already friends and then, you know, see what happens. But I feel that, um a lot of people like they, they you know yeah, yeah they sort of um i guess what i'm trying to say is that yeah it's hard to 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 sort of enter the interactions from from like a positive from a, yeah like from, yeah. From and a positive perspective that i you know that i hope will come from just you know having been through this pandemic is you know, I think it's given us appreciation of the extent to which people are struggling. Mm. And, um, and this was true long before the pandemic, right? You know, but we often didn't know, right? Um, and I feel like during the pandemic, we had more, um, more recognition, more openness, more, more compassion to recognizing that people are struggling and we don't know, um, you know, are, are they, you know, are, are, are they having problems with their job? Are they having problems with their health? Are they having problems with mental health? We're all just trying to do our best to get through this. Right. And when the reality is that even long before and long after people are going to be struggling. Yeah. And one of the things that I hope that we, we come away from this is that, you know, let's say someone's not the friendliest to you or doesn't respond in the way you wanted to and isn't responding to your texts is that we give people a break because we never know what's going on. We don't know. And it might have absolutely nothing to do with you. <laughs> yeah, we, we all have a complex that we're the center of the world. And it's like, no one. Yeah, cares. yeah. <laughs> we're like an afterthought. Like if someone didn't respond to you, like it's it's probably not even because of you. They just have other things on their mind. Like it's just. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so instead of thinking like either that it's you or that person's a total jerk, <laughs> it might be, oh gosh, I hope they're okay. Yeah. I wonder what's going on. <laughs> but I also, I also find that, uh, you know, sometimes what I think is very powerful is, uh, you know, sometimes like someone can uh, actually uh, have a bad intention, you know, so someone can come to you with like a negative uh, perspective like you know a negative I would say uh, like uh, context in their mind uh, and then you know you so you know so someone's going to make a comment maybe they're trying to make fun of you or something and then you know you also have a decision to either 
sort of accept the underlying narrative that the person is pushing and sort of like respond defensively or, you know, or, you know, like basically sort of like enter that dynamic, or you can also um, sort of like take some perspective and say something like from the side that doesn't, you know, like uh, almost uh, being like so naive that, you know, you, you don't even see the, the evil intention and you say something that's co completely going to like, like the person isn't going to expect it. And even though they initially thought that they were going to sort of like attack you in the end, you know, everything's fine. And, and, you know, you're laughing with them and you can sort of like uh, unlock situations. Uh, and, and the reason I'm saying this is because I feel like a lot of people, they, they seem to think that, you know, other people's reaction to them is almost like a preset. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I found is that, you know, you, you kind of create your reality as you go. And so, you know, if you approach someone with a positive energy, like that is going to have tremendous impact uh, versus if you approach them with like a neutral energy or, you know, like a negative one. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's very interesting. And, and also like one of the key insight that a lot of people that I do those videos with have is uh, they're surprised by uh, how most people are just happy to talk to them. Like that's one of the, they're like, well, it's so surprising. Like some people are just like so down, you know, like sometimes you woke up to someone and they're a bit hesitant, but from time to, I would say like 20% of the cases, you woke up someone and they're just like, it's like they were waiting for you, you know, and people are always like, well, like I didn't expect that, you know? And uh, I know yeah, it, it just to shows that, you know, you shouldn't be trapped in your assumptions and, and sort of oh, like absolutely. give people yeah. the benefit of the doubt, you know? And, you know, I, I, um, I'm, I uh, don't remember all the details, but I do recall that there was a study that came out where they asked people to talk to complete strangers on a train. Yeah, I actually <laughs> And um, everyone assumed that people would be annoyed and, <laughs> um, and it would be a horrible experience. Um, and, you know, I don't remember all the ways that they measured it, but um, generally they had very positive outcomes. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, it goes to show you that it's, and, and, you know, similar to, to the experiences that you had with these people um, that, that are doing this, um, that, you know, e even when they systematically study it, <laughs> it it's um, showing um, some positive um, effects. And so we, we need to get out of our shells yeah. and, uh, and, and kind of break down some of these barriers that are holding us back. Yeah. And actually on that study, they even showed that the people who initially thought like that they don't want to talk to people, uh, once they ended up talking to people, then they were actually like happy that they, that, that they had done it. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so, so it also shows that sometimes people, they don't know what they, they, don't know what they want and, and everyone likes a surprise. Because yeah. uh, I think sometimes people are over concerned with bothering people, uh, you know, and they, they don't want to be a nuisance. Um, but it's like, you know, you know, first of all, you're not going to be, I mean, as long as you're polite, like it's fine. And, and also, you know, who knows what, what, what can happen. Um, so can I ask what, what, what prompted you or led you to start that? So uh, me like basic, okay. So initially like what, what, what's, the, so, you know, since I'm younger, I would say I, I was always uh, like, a, I had a very, so, hmm, sorry, let me, uh, break down the thing. So I think that I have one very social side to my personality. Uh, when I was young, I always, uh, you know, I, I, I never belonged to like the, the, the big groups, you know, but uh, I always had like a few very good friends. Uh, and some of those friends were like, you know, I, I, like one of my best friend was like the biggest nerd in the class. The other one was like the cool kid. And, you know, I had another one who was like maybe like a, a skater or something. And I would have like a few very strong relationships. And then, you know, through those people, they will bring me, right? So, you know, I never felt left out. Like I was always invited to all sorts of different groups because I always had like one person in that group that I was really close with. But then like, I never felt like, uh, I, I never liked big groups. There's actually a French rapper in one of his songs. He says, I never feel more alone that than when the party is at its height. And like that, I, I, I always like connected to this. Uh, and so I've always been like social and been uh, 
it's been easy for me to like talk to different people, but there were one side that I, uh, I, uh, that bothered me a lot. Uh, it's it's going to sound um, trivial, but I, I mean, I would say actually it's pretty fundamental is, you know, a lot of times uh, in my late teens, you know, I would see a cute girl, right. And uh, I wanted to talk to her and I, and I couldn't do it. And I mean, I've, at a fundamental level, you know, uh, it's like there's a human being next to me uh, and I want to say something to them. I don't want to harass them. I don't want to cause them any trouble. I, I just want to say hi, you know. Uh, but there is this inside force that's preventing me from from saying hello, you know, like what, like. And that uh, I, I that really bothered me. Uh, it took me a long time to get over that uh, fence, uh, like a few years. Um, and yeah, initially it was just like. If I want to talk to someone and I have good intentions, I think you know, you're, fro you're frozen on my end. Oh, let's see. Uh, oh, you're back. <laughs> okay. Is it good now? Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, like you know, f for me it was basically like if there is someone I want to talk to, and I'm polite and I have good intentions, like wh why can't I do it? And that really like sort of uh, troubled me. And one of the main thing I realized is that. My problem, at least, I mean, I don't, we don't need to generalize it, but at least my problem was that it's not necessarily that I was afraid. Um, how can I say this? I think one day I realized that the days where I would express myself more, I was more likely to talk to whoever I wanted. And I started to become uh, very aware of a lot of moments where I would censor myself, you know, like, like moments that if you think about it, if you take them individually, like they, they seem worthless, like there is an old lady with a pink hat and I want to say nice hat, but I don't. Or I'm in line at the grocery store and I want to make a joke. I don't. Or, you know, I'm sitting in a bus and there is someone next to me and I think about just making conversation, but I'm like, oh, you know, whatever, they're, they're busy, whatever. And, and, and so I don't. And I start to realize like, wow, well, like I actually censor myself all the time, like all the time for years, you know, and I started realizing that one, I was building this habit of like censoring myself. So it's like, you know, you're next to someone, you want to say something, it's like a ball appears in your hand and you want to throw it, but instead you, you keep it, right? So I built this habit of like keeping things in. And also I realized that I was preventing myself from so much experiences, right? Like if in the last five years or 10 years, I had always said what I wanted to say to the people around me, I would have met so many more people, like I would be a different person. Um, and so, and so that, that, that's sort of like how I, I, I started because I was like, yeah, like I, if I want to talk to someone, like the, there is no reason I, I shouldn't be able to. And, and it's not even like from this, the, the perspective of like, oh, you know, I'm going to become friends with everyone and everyone's going to love me. It's just like, I feel like I should be able to express myself with ease. And then, you know, some people I'm going to click, some people I'm not going to click. Like that's, that's life, right? Like that's beyond, you know. I mean, I don't, I only have 24 hours in a day. I don't have time to click with everyone anyway. But um, yeah, for me, it was just, uh, I think that that's what started it. It, it was, I, at first it was very like dating uh, focus. I was like, you know, why can't I meet this woman? Like, you know, it, it's, it's a perfectly good time. But as I, but that this was like the, the entrance of the rabbit hole because I, I realized that actually my problem wasn't talking to women I was attracted to, it was expressing myself when I wanted to. And also, you know, what do I think I have in common with people? You know, because uh, something that I learned a lot from, I think is, you know, as a, you know, we, we meet, we usually meet people through context and, you know, we, we use those contexts to relate, right? Like we're both in the same school. You take this class, I take that class. We both know, you know, John or Lindsay or whatever. But uh, when I started, basically meeting people randomly, like grocery store, walking around. Then uh, I would first initiate those interactions, but then the problem was, okay, like what, what now? Like, what, what do I say? Like, how do I connect with people? Um, and, and then it opened a whole new area of like, what do I actually have in common with people? Uh, even if I don't know them, you know, like, like what do we, what is the common human experience so that I can, you know, meet someone and from a blank canvas, I can like quickly, you know, just be chill and, and have a good moment, you know? And so, I don't know, it, it just sort of, a, it's like, yeah, it, it was just like a rabbit hole. And as I moved past one step, then like another step opened. And I, and, you know, at, at the end, I also felt that relationships are, you know, so important. I mean, 
I'm 30 right now, but uh, you know, as I think of my life, I, I feel like the only thing that I remember or that I cherish is, is my memories with people, my relationships. And um, I would argue that it's the most critical variable of your life. So I feel like the way in which you interact with people is, uh, is a strong variable that people should, should, you know, should pay attention to. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't know if I was a bit yeah. uh, all yeah. over the place, but that's, uh, that's how. No, I, thank you for sharing. That, that, that's, that's uh, yeah. Uh, and so what, what about you in your own life? Are you, um, are you lonely? Do you meet people? Uh, are you happy with um, friends? Uh, I mean, certainly I think um, there have been moments in my life where I've felt lonely. And I think if um, anyone who says that they've never been lonely is probably lying <laughs> um, because uh, it's a, a part of normal human experience um, in the sense of, um, uh, um, the way we describe it, and you know, from a variety of, of scientific perspectives, is that we are um, fundamentally social beings. Humans are, and um, and that loneliness is like a biological drive, just like hunger and thirst. Yeah. Um, and that just like hunger motivates us to seek out food and thirst motivates us to seek out water. Loneliness motivates us to, you know, seek out others and, and reconnect socially. And so, um, you know, that'd be like saying you've never felt thirsty in your life. <laughs> um, um, and so there, you know, that, that's a whole other concept or, or discussion about how we need to stop, um, you know, having so much um, shame and stigma around, you um, you know, talking about isolation and loneliness, but, um, you know, I really got into this because of the opposite end, um, the powerful um, protective effects of being socially connected. And um, I actually grew up in a large family. I'm one of six kids. Wow. Wow. Um, I, um, and my father was one of five kids. Um, and so I grew up with lots of cousins and aunts and uncles and, you know, very, um, tight close-knit family and um and so uh and and you know my my parents always raised my my siblings and I you know that that your you know your siblings are should be your best friends and and so we've all um remained very close mm -hmm. um and so I you know I'm incredibly grateful for my relationships mm -hmm. and you know, even when things have been tough, I've, I've had, I've had them, you know, in my life. And so even when friends have come and gone, um, or I'm having, you know, I, I always have, I always have my family. Um, and I, so, you know, I, I, uh, it's something that, um, you know, and, and certainly I, I need to continue to work on because I'm not perfect, but, um, you know, I really try to nurture my, my friendships. Um, and, but also, um, you know, one of the things I always am trying to remind myself is, um, you know, especially, especially over the pandemic, when everyone's talking about isolation and loneliness, um, and I'm doing, you know, tons of virtual talks and trying to help um, various organizations is, as I'm researching relationships and I'm talking about relationships and trying to raise awareness around, you know, the important health effects of this is I need to also take time to like nurture my own relationships. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I gotta, I gotta practice what I preach. Right. <laughs> um, and so uh, that's something that, you know, like I said, I, you know, I'm sure I'm not perfect and I still need to do better. Um, but it's something that I'm constantly striving mm. to improve on in, mm. even in my own life. Yeah. Um, you know, how can I be a better friend? How can I be a better sister? How can I be a better mm. wife? How can I be a better mm. mother? Um, and I've got two, two teenage boys. Um, and so, you know, I'm also, um, from a personal standpoint, you know, thinking about like, okay, how are you? Are you lonely? <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, and of course, whenever, um, uh, you know, uh, I try to get them to, you know, 
do their homework or do something other than be with friends. It's like, but mom, your research shows. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they have a fun way of, you know, throwing that back in my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, I have to go out. It's, uh, it's for my health. <laughs> I, I can't do my my chores. I can't can't clean my room. I, I really need to be with my friends. <laughs> That's funny. It's like uh, yeah. I mean, I I saw that study about. Uh, I mean, like you you you, uh, you know it, it, you were. I saw. I think it was on an article that said like yeah, if you're lonely, it's like smoking like 15 cigarettes a day. And uh, I mean, I don't I, I don't smoke, but sometimes if I'm out, like it can happen. And I always rush on my mind. I'm like. I'm like, you know what? It's fine. I have, I have, I have friends. Like, it's okay. I can just smoke one. <laughs> so, <just> FYI, <laughs> um, all the things that we do um, can potentially impact our longevity. So, yeah, uh, unfortunately, you know, um, we still need to, yeah, even yeah, if we have yeah. friends, we still need to eat well, get yeah. sleep, <laughs> um, quit smoking. You know, we still need to do all yeah, of the yeah, things yeah. Um, that contribute to health. So yeah. I, I always worry that someone's going to, you know, take this research to like somehow dis dismiss just, or diminish the importance of something else. Um, yeah. And that, that's not my intent, but rather just to say we should take these, um, take our relationships mm. just as seriously. Or maybe, <laughs> or, may, or, may, or maybe it will get, uh, it, maybe the, the, the cigarettes company can uh, make an ad about how, smoking helps you make friends which then cancels the effect of smoking <laughs> I hope not <laughs> that's funny um and and, and so and uh, i mean if you exercise with a friend then you get double benefit <laughs> nice that's that's true that's true um and look uh, i guess i mean looking forward like are, are you um Yes, are, are you still doing research in that? In that, like, are you currently like doing some? Um, Absolutely. I, I, yeah. Um, so I'm doing a lot of um, involved in some exciting things right now. Um, well, one, I just um, I think maybe a week ago um, published a new meta analysis. Um, okay. And so remember, um, so for, you know, just for people who might be viewing this, who might not know what a meta analysis is, it's um, it's you know kind of what I described earlier, where you take all of the studies, all of the evidence that that exists, and you actually get that data and combine the data and statistically um, analyze uh, across studies. Um, and the point of that is that it it gives us so much more um, confidence and stronger evidence than any one individual study. You know how you sometimes you might hear on the news. Like, oh, this week um, eating eggs is good for you. And the next week, oh, there's a study showing it's bad for you. Well, we combine all the studies that look at that same thing um, and, and uh, mm. show what the overall effect is um, so that you can make sense of it, right? And uh, so the latest one that I did is um, looking at uh, um, interventions in medical settings. So part of this, part of my line of, of work is really um, not only what is the health effects, but now, now that we know, how do we integrate that into medical and healthcare? How do we um, uh, in, implement that into public health policy? How do we, you know, how do we make a difference in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so what this, this showed was that um, interventions in medical settings, so um, it included 106 randomized controlled trials with 40,000 patients. Patients who were randomly assigned, who randomly got um, uh, some kind of uh, support, social support or psychosocial support in addition to their standard medical treatment. Um, had an increase of 20% um, survival compared to those who just got standard tr medical treatment. Mm -hmm. And um, and when among the ones that looked at how long they survived, it was they survived 29% longer. So having that support in addition to um, standard medical treatment, people lived longer. Yeah. <laughs> they had better medical outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's one um, study that I did, but um, 
part of what I'm, I'm working on is, well, um, I was part of a National Academy of Science consensus committee that issued a report that's available to the public that provides um, a summary of, of the evidence, but also um, recommendations for mm. medical and healthcare settings on what they can do mm. um, to, to um, integrate this into, in, in, into health and medical care settings. Um, I'm also working with um, Health and Human Services Administration for Community Living to create a national clearinghouse of, so any user, so people in the public who are looking for some way to get in, you know, some kind of maybe some kind of program that might help them if they're lonely. Mm. Um, we are establishing this clearinghouse that will um, provide information about uh, things that are available, but um, that are evidence-based. Mm. Uh, and so there are lots of community-based organizations that um, are uh, very um, well-intended, but maybe don't have the resources to, to test what they're doing and um, maybe are, are based kind of intuitively on what they think might work. Mm. Um, but what we're putting together is ones that have actually been tested and shown to have some... Um, effectiveness in, in um, reducing loneliness um, mm. so that people can, can um, you know, when they're looking for, for, for resources, have a place to go. Mm. Um, and so those are just a couple things that I'm working on, but we're um, heavily involved in, in um, really, really looking at how we can take this evidence of just how important this is and how can we have an impact in a way that can impact the individual to communities to even um, policy and 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 also working with international organizations because we can learn from each other yeah. um, and so um, you know I'm working with colleagues in Australia I'm working with colleagues in Germany um, <laughs> I'm you know we're working across um, across countries mm. to see if we can find a way to share best practices yeah. and, um, and, and what works in, in another country might works, um, you know, in, in our local area. So, um, so it, it's really trying to bridge evidence and practice mm. um, to, to make a difference. If you are ever, I mean, I, I feel like, uh, I don't know, if you're ever on like some like pool, like, committee in a city or something like I feel like urban planning like I think uh, I, I used to live in San Francisco uh, and there were uh, a square there it was it's uh, in Hayes Valley it's called Patricia's Green so you have like a street and then you have a little street park with like benches all around and some chairs uh, and I loved that neighborhood because I felt it was so conducive to neighborhood life because you had a lot of benches and chairs and so people would just come and sit and drink their coffee and like talk to the people around them. I used to spend like hours, like I used to love to go there on weekends just to like talk to random people. Uh, and I feel like, I feel like it's kind of missing. I feel like in a lot of cities, uh, you just, you, 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 you're you just walking and you, you can never stop walking or you have to enter like a store or a coffee shop. Like you have to un enter like some, like some store basically. Uh, I don't know. I'm just I'm just doing that because I'm very yeah, sensitive no. to like um, vibes of our city. built environment is huge. And, um, um, how our how our homes are designed, our workplaces are designed, our communities are designed makes a huge difference yeah. in terms of, of of how we interact. Um, you know, far too many um, areas are being designed for cars for instead cars. of for people, yeah. <laughs> um, and and you know, how we move about our environment influences the kind of contact we have with other people. Yeah. And so one of my, you know, one of my big concerns um, about some of the lasting effects of the pandemic is that um, some of the, the methods that have been designed to reduce social contact, to reduce the spread of the virus, 
maybe become more permanent. Mm. So if, if waiting rooms, airports, workplaces are redesigned to limit social contact, you know, mm. to, to help protect people from a virus, well, that may isolate people more. Mm. Um, and so, and, and when you des redesign spaces, that might have much more lasting effects yeah. um, because it might take a lot longer for those spaces to get redesigned. Yeah. Um, and so it's, you know, it, it's really, I think, amazing how during the pandemic, we saw how in that effort to reduce social contact, to reduce the spread of the virus, which was of course important. Um, but what I, what I noticed was that um, how it impacted almost every aspect of our life mm. from transportation to education, you name it, right? Um, you know, I think we'd be hard pressed to find um, areas that, that weren't affected, right? Yeah. Uh, in some way. But what that also shows to, to me, and I hope to the world, is how all of these aspects of our life have the potential to impact us socially. Mm. for good or for bad in the sense of it can either um, in, encourage and foster greater social connection or it can limit our, mm. our social connection. And what that also suggests is that each one of these sectors potentially has a, a role to play in addressing mm. the issue of isolation and loneliness. Mm. Um, and so, you know, when we think about policy, um, uh, you, you know, we can think of the you know, the World Health Organization has the framework of health and all policy. And it talks about how, you know, across sectors, there's relevance to health. Well, I think we can also think of, you know, social and all policy. Mm. Um, and that, you know, across all these sectors that we have the potential to, to um, have, have an impact on our, our lives socially. Mm. Okay, cool. Um, Thank you very much. I have just yeah. one last question. What is this painting behind you? <laughs> <laughs> um, that was something I was just playing around with. Um, and you, you I painted it. I did. Oh, nice. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I, also, I also noticed that your books are colored. They're ordered by colors. So yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Cool painting. I, uh, when I was in college, I, uh, for my last year, uh, we like threw some paint on the wall and uh, it looked absolutely, it, it looked magnificent. Like the, the, the intricacies of, of all of the drops and stuff. I, I kind of like uh, this type of like uh, random like shapes. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, I wouldn't know how to qualify it, but uh, it's cool. Nice. Good for well, you. So fun fact, I actually did my undergrad in art. Okay. <laughs> And I have a lot of artwork throughout my house, but some of it is a little bit too busy for a background. Mm. <laughs> um, and this one's a little bit more. Uh, I didn't notice awesome. at the beginning. And then at some point I was like, wait, wait what is this thing like? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, but I, I, um, I really love art and, and, you know, in fact, there is some evidence to suggest that creative expression um, is associated with mm. less loneliness. So like, I feel like all express, I feel like all expression, like, I feel like, uh, I feel like, yeah, I, I feel like expression versus like censoring. Like, I feel like people are, there's too much pressure to like keep things inside, you know? And I feel like that creates like a lot of like frustrations and like missed opportunities and, and so, yeah, I mean, yeah. And then, you know, people, people look at your art and they're like, oh, like it's nice and stuff. So it's cool. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah. That was very really cool. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I think I'm going to publish this on when, like next Wednesday, I think. Um, so I'll email you, I'll email you a link when I do. Um, okay. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's okay. it. <laughs> Well, it was great talking to you um, and, and remind me where you're located. So right now, so I, I used to live in San Francisco for the last seven years. 
And uh, in August, basically, uh, everyone left San Francisco. There was like a mass exodus out of the city. And so over the summer, like literally 95% of my friends left. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm also going to go. And I had this idea in mind for a long time that I wanted to like travel the U.S. and just kind of like, you know, I've been living in the U.S. for 10 years, but I, I, I don't know it that well. So I've been kind of like uh, moving around. Like I, I've been spending like two, three months in different cities. Uh, and right now I'm in New York. Um, and uh, I'm going to keep traveling probably until the end of the year. And then I'll probably move either to New York or, or Miami. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure yet. But uh, right now, uh, yeah, I'm kind of moving on. And actually, one of the reasons I wanted to do this was also to meet my subscribers in different cities. So I do those videos where yeah, like I meet with the subscriber and I spend a day with them. I put a mic on them and I film them, talk to people because when I did it, so I started my channel doing a lot of like hidden cameras of me talking to, you know, an old man on a bench, like some weird like homeless artist, uh, a cute girl crossing the street, like all sorts of interactions. But a lot of people would like tell me, oh, you know, like you have a French accent or you know, people are nice to you because you're a foreigner, or like they would try to like discredit my experience. And so then I had the idea like, well, you know, uh, actually like they're right. Like, you know, I, I should film other people do it to show that, you know, it's a universal challenge. Uh, I have some, you know, handsome looking people in there that are struggling. I have some like, you know, less handsome. I have some shy people, some confident people, tall people, short people, all races uh, and, and uh, yeah, that, that's why I'm doing this. And so I took this opportunity. I was like, you know what? Actually, this is the perfect timing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go around and, and film people in different cities. And uh, yeah, I think I'm going to keep doing that for a few months until like COVID like dies down a bit. And then, uh, and then yeah, I'll talk I mean, one of the things I'll tell you um, that might be interesting is, um, and I've had multiple reporters ask me, um, about, you know, to what extent people are, are going to feel comfortable re-engaging as we are emerging, at, you know, from the lifted restrictions and how, you know, how hesitant people will be. Um, and so that, you know, I'd, I'd be interested to see how that affects, um, uh you know what you're doing i mean to be honest i've been filming yeah. most of my videos during the pandemic and people yeah. I, I think you know that people i think that people you know they they make a lot of generalities in their mind so they think like you know oh the pandemic i don't want to talk to people or some people think oh if i'm reading a book i don't want to talk to people or oh, if i'm wearing headphones i don't want to talk to people and so i think people like when they do those kind of generalities they think of like a few scenarios in their mind where you know whether it's like they don't want what they're what they're talking about but the truth is that there's billions of possibilities. And, and, and once you're in a moment, like, you know, people like they think, like when you said, like people think in generalities, but once you're in the moment, it's not a generality anymore. It's, it's you and this other person. And whether they think, oh, they don't want to talk to people because it's a pandemic or because of this or because of that. Once they're in the moment, I think that the generality, like yeah. it's irrelevant. Yeah. You know, like someone might say, oh, I don't want to talk to people, but then, when you're in front of them, they think, you know what? I never talk to people. I'll do it now. You know, so, so, so you don't like people. Uh, I think it's. Um, yeah, I, I, I personally haven't uh, seen. I mean, like sometimes there's people who say, oh, you know, like, you know, they want you to wear a mask or whatever. Like sometimes peop some people, but I would say that's like honestly less than one percent. I, I think that most people are, are pretty happy actually to to talk and, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, cool. Well, thank okay. you so much. Uh, have a great day, and uh, yeah, I'll send you. Um, I'll send you the things when I have it, uh, so you can watch it. And, Sounds uh, good. It was so great uh, talking with you and and getting to know you better too. Yeah, it was very cool. Thank you so much, and uh, yeah, have a have a nice day. Okay. Take care. Take care.